Little House on the Prairie, chapter six, called Moving In. And this is a picture that they show. Some teepees. Some Native Americans there. Moving in. The walls are up, Pa was saying to Ma in the morning. We better move in and get along as best we can without a floor or other fixings. I must build the stable as fast as I can so Pet and Patty can be inside walls too. Last night I could hear wolves howling from every direction. Seemed like and very close too. Well, you have your gun, so I'll not worry, said Ma. Yes, and there's Jack, but I'll feel easier in my mind when you and the girls have a good solid walls around you. Why do you suppose we haven't seen any Indians? Ma asked. Oh, I don't know, Pa replied carelessly. I've seen their camping places among the bluffs. They're away on a hunting trip now, I guess. Then Ma called, girls, the sun's up. And Laura and Mary scrambled out of bed and into their clothes. Eat your breakfast quickly, Ma said, putting the last of the rabbit stew in their tin plates. We're moving into the house today and all the chips must be out. So they ate quickly and they hurried to carry the chips out of the house. They ran back and forth as, full, as fast as they could, gathering their skirts full of chips and dumping them in a pile near the fire. But there were still chips on the ground inside the house when Laura began to sweep with her willow bough broom. So chips, I think they're referring to buffalo chips. So when buffaloes poop, it hardens and they leave these chips. And um, I think we're gonna learn more about this in the Prairie book, I'm hoping, but and I'll look it up. But they used it also um, in the fires. So it was just like a hard round chips, they called them. Ma limped, though her sprained ankle was beginning to get well, but soon she swept the earthen floor, and then Laura and Mary began to help her carry things into the house. Pa was on top of the walls, stretching the canvas wagon top over the skeleton roof of just staplings, or sorry, of just saplings. So ha saplings are just like small branches, so the roof isn't fully built, and so... The cabin is built, and there he is trying to put the canvas over the top so they have some sort of roof. The canvas top over the skeleton roof of saplings. The canvas billowed in the wind, and Pa's beard blew wildly, and his hair stood up from his head as if he were trying to pull himself out. He held on to the canvas and fought it. Once it jerked so hard that Laura thought he must let go over the sail, and he must let go or he'll sail into the air like a bird but he held tight to the wall with his legs and then tight to the canvas with his hands and he tied it down. There, he said, stay where you are and be. Charles, Ma said. She stood with her arms full of quilts and looked up at him reprovingly. And be good, Pa said to the canvas. Why, Caroline, what did you think I was going to say? Oh, Charles, Ma said, you scallywag. Pa came right down to the corner of the house. The ends of the log stuck out and he used them for a ladder. He ran his hands through his hair so that it stood up even more wildly and Ma burst out laughing. And then he hugged her, quilts and all. Then they looked at the house and Pa said, how's that for a snug house? I'll be thankful to get into it, said Ma. There was no door and there were no windows. There was no floor except the ground and no roof except the canvas. But that house had good stout walls and it would stay where it was. It was not like the wagon that every morning went on to some other place. We're going to do well here, Caroline, Pa said. This is a great country. This is a country I'll be contented to stay in the rest of my life. Even when it's settled up, Ma said. That means like when more people come and settle there. Even when it's settled up, no matter how thick and close the neighbors get, this country will never feel crowded. Just look at that sky. Laura knew what he meant. She liked this place too. She liked the enormous sky and the winds and the land that you couldn't see to the end of. Everything was so free and big and splendid. By dinner time, the house was in order. The beds were neatly made on the floor. The wagon seat and two ends of logs were brought in for chairs. Pa's gun lay on his peg above the doorway. Boxes and bundles were neat against the walls. It was a pleasant house. A soft light came through the canvas roof. Wind and sunshine came through the window holes and every crack in the four walls glowed a little because the sun was overhead. Only the campfire stayed where it had been. Pa said he would build a fireplace in the house as soon as he could. 
He would hew out slabs to make a solid roof too before the winter came. He would lay a floor and make beds and tables and chairs, but all that work must wait until he had helped Mr. Edwards and had built the stable for Pet and Patty. When, it, when it's all done, said Ma, I want a clothesline. Pa laughed. Yes, and I want a well. After dinner, he hatched, hitched Pet and Patty to the wagon and he hauled a tub full of water from the creek so that Ma could do the washing. You could wash the clothes in the creek, he told her. In Indian women do it. If we wanted to live like Indians, you could make a hole in the roof and let the smoke out, and we'd have the fire on the floor inside the house, said Ma. Indians do. So she's teasing him. That afternoon, she washed the clothes in the tub and spread them on the grass to dry. After supper, they sat for a while by the campfire. That night, they would sleep in their house. They would never sleep beside a campfire again. Pa and Ma talked about the folks in Wisconsin, and Ma wished she could send them a letter but Independence was 40 miles away and no letter could go out until Pa made the long trip to the post office there. Back in the big woods so far away, Grandpa and Grandma and the aunts and uncles and the cousins did not know where Pa and Ma and Laura and Maybe, Mary and Baby Carrie were. And sitting there by the campfire, no one knew what might be happening in the big woods. There was no way to find out. Well, it's bedtime, Ma said. Baby Carrie was already asleep. Ma carried her into the house and undressed her while Laura and Mary unbuttoned Laura's dress and petticoat waist down the back, and Pa hung a quilt over the door hole. The quilt would be better than no door at all. Then Pa went out to bring Pet and Patty close to the house. Here's Laura and Mary. Ma's tucking them in. So since there's no door, they hung that quilt there for a door. Pa's gun is over it. They have a lantern hanging down so they can see. And there's another little bed over there. And then they have a stump. That's a little table. Mm. Pa called softly. Come out here, Caroline, and look at the moon. Mary and Laura lay in their bed on the couch inside the new house and watched the sky through the window hole to the east. The edge of the big, bright moon glittered at the bottom of the window space, and Laura sat up. She looked at the great moon, sailing silently higher in the clear sky. It made silvery lines and all the cracks on that side of the house. The light poured through the window hole and made a square of soft, radiant light on the floor. It was so bright that Laura saw Ma plainly when she lifted the quilt at the door and came in. Then Laura very quickly lay down before Ma saw her naughtily sitting up in bed. She heard Pet and, Pine, Pet and Patty whining softly to Pa. Then she heard the faint thuds of their feet as she put her ear to the floor. Pet and Patty and Pa were coming toward the house, and Laura heard Pa singing, Sail on, silver moon, shed your radiance over the sky. His voice was like part of the night and the moonlight and the stillness of the prairie. He came to the doorway singing, By the pale silver light of the moon. Ma said, hush, Charles, you'll wake the children. So Pa came in without a sound. Jack followed at his heels and he lay down in the doorway. Now they were all inside the stout walls of their new home and they were snug and safe. Drowsily, Laura heard a long wolf howl rising from far away on the prairie, but only a little shiver went up her backbone and soon she fell asleep. The next chapter is called The Wolf Pack. All in one day, Pa and Mr. Edwards built the stable for Pet and Patty. They even put the roof on it, working so late that Ma had to keep supper waiting for them. There was no stable door yet, but in the moonlight, Pa drove two stout posts well into the ground, one on either side of the doorway. He put Pet and Patty inside the stable, and then he laid small split logs, one above the other across the door space. The posts held them, and they made a solid wall. Now, said Pa, let those wolves howl. I'll sleep through it tonight. In the morning, when he lifted the split log from behind the post, Laura was amazed. Beside Pet stood a long-legged, long-eared, wobbly little colt. When Laura ran to, to it, gentle Pet laid back her ears and snapped her teeth at Laura. Keep back, Laura, Pa said sharply. And then he said to Pet, 
Now, Pat, you know we won't hurt your little colt. Pa answered him with a soft, Pat answered him with a soft whinny. She would let Pa stroke her colt, but she would not let Laura or Mary come near it. When they even peeked at it through the cracks in the stable wall, Pet rolled the whites of her eyes at them and showed them her big teeth. They had never seen a colt with ears so long. Pa said it was a little mule, but Laura said it looked like a jackrabbit, so they named that little colt Bunny. When Pet was on the picket line with Bunny frisking around her and wondering at the big world, Laura must watch baby Carrie carefully. If anyone but Pa came near Bunny, Pet squealed with rage and dashed to bite the little girl. So here you can see their whole setup. There's Bunny and Pet, and there's the house. The fire's outside because they haven't built a fireplace yet, and Ma did get a clothesline. And then there's the stable in the back. And then there's Laura and Carrie. Early that Sunday afternoon, Pa rode Patty across the prairie to see what he should see. There was plenty of meat in the house, so he did not take his gun. He rode away through the tall grass along the rim of the creek bluffs. Birds flew up before him and circled and sank back into the grasses. Pa was looking down into the creek bottoms as he rode. Perhaps he was, watch he was watching deer browsing there. Then Patty broke into a gallop, and swiftly she and Pa grew smaller. Soon, there was only waving grass where they had once been. Late that afternoon, Pa had not come home. Ma stirred the coals of the fire and laid chips on them and began to get supper. Mary was in the house, minding the baby, Carrie, and Laura asked Ma, what's the matter with Jack? Jack was walking up and down, looking worried. He wrinkled his nose at the wind, and the hair rose up on his neck, and he lay down and then rose up again. Pat's hoofs suddenly thudded, thudded thudded and he ran around the circle of her picket rope and stood there. Bunny came close to her. What's the matter, Jack? Ma asked. He looked up at her, but he couldn't say anything. Ma gazed around the whole circle of the earth and sky. She didn't see anything unusual. Likely it isn't anything, Laura, she said, and she raked the coals around the coffee pot and the spider and on top of the bake oven. The prairie hen sizzled in the spider and the corn cake began to smell good. Remember that the spider is just a, a pot that you put on the fire, but it has legs to hold it up over the fire. So it's called a spider because it's had, like, has spider legs. The prairie hen sizzled in the spider and the corn cakes began to smell good. But all the time, Ma kept glancing at the prairie all around. Jack walked about restlessly and Pet did not graze. She faced the northwest where Pa had gone and she kept her colt close beside her. All at once, Patty came running across the prairie. She was stretched out, running with all her might, and Pa was leaning almost flat on her neck. She ran right past the stable before Pa could stop her. He stopped her so hard that she almost sat down. She was trembling all over, and her black coat was streaked with sweat and foam. Pa swung off her. He was breathing hard. What is the matter, Charles? Ma asked him. Pa was looking toward the creek, so Ma and Laura looked too, but they could see only the space above the bottomlands with a few treetops in it and the distant tops of the earthen bluffs under the high prairie grasses. What is it? Ma asked again. What? Why did you ride Patty like that? Pa took in a deep breath. <gasps> I was afraid the wolves would beat me here, but I see everything's all right. Wolves? Ma cried. What wolves? Everything's all right, Caroline, said Pa. Let a fellow catch his breath. When he got some breath, he said, I didn't ride Patty like that. It was all I could do to hold on to her. Fifty wolves, Caroline, the biggest wolves I ever saw. I wouldn't go through such a thing again, not for a mint of money. A shadow came over the prairie just then because the sun had gone down and Pa said, I'll tell you about it later. Well, we'll eat supper in the house, said Ma. No need for that, he told her. Jack will give us warning in plenty of time. He brought Pet and Patty and the colt from the picket line. He didn't take them and Patty to drink from the creek as he usually did. He gave them water in Ma's wash tub, which was standing full, ready for the washing the next morning. He rubbed down Patty's sweaty sides and legs and put her in the barn with Pet and Bunny. Supper was ready. 
The campfire made a circle of light in the dark. Laura and Mary stayed close to the fire and kept baby Carrie with them. They could feel the dark all around them and they kept looking behind them at the place where the dark mixed with the edge of the firelight. Shadows moved there as if they were alive. Jack sat up on his haunches besides Laura. The edges of his ears were lifted. He was listening in the dark. Now and then he walked a little way into the dark. He walked all around the campfire and then he came back to sit beside Laura. The hair lay flat on his thick neck and he did not growl. His tooth, his teeth showed a little bit, but that's because he was a bulldog. Laura and Mary ate their corn cakes and their prairie hen drumsticks and they listened to Pa while he told Ma about the wolves. So here's a picture of them eating their drum, their um, prairie hen. It's like chicken legs, but they're hen legs. That was Laura and there's Mary. <clears throat> and then Pa began to tell Ma about the wolves. He had found some more neighbors. Settlers were coming in and settling along both sides of the creek. Less than three miles away in a hollow on the high prairie, a man and his wife were building a house. Their name was Scott, and Pa said they were nice folks. Six miles beyond them, two bachelors were living in one house. They had taken two farms and built the house on the line between them. One man's bunk was against one wall of the house and the other man's bunk was against the other wall. So each man could sleep on his own farm, although they were in the same house and the house was only eight feet wide. They cooked and ate together in the middle of the house. Pa had still not said anything about the wolves. Laura wished he would, but she knew that she must not interrupt when Pa was talking. He said that these bachelors did not know that anyone else was in the country. They had not seen anybody but Indians. So they were glad to see Pa and he stayed there longer than he had meant to, talking. Then he rode on, and from a little rise in the prairie, he saw a white speck down in the creek bottoms. He thought it was a covered wagon, and it was. When he came to it, he found a man and his wife and five children. They had come from Iowa, and they had camped in the bottoms because one of the horses was sick. The horse was better now, but the bad night air so near the creek had given them a fever. The man said his wife and the three oldest children were too sick to stand up. The little boy and girl, no bigger than Mary and Laura, were taking care of them. So Pa did what he could for them, and then he rode back to tell the bachelors about them. One of them rode away right away to fetch the family on the high prairie, where they would soon get well in the good air. One thing had led to another until Pa was starting home much later than he had meant to. He took a shortcut across the prairie, and as he was loping alongside Patty, suddenly out of a little drawer came draw came a pack of wolves. They were all around Pa in a minute. It was a big pack, Pa said, all of 50 wolves and the biggest wolves I've ever seen in my life. Must be what they call buffalo wolves. The leader is a big gray brute that stands three feet at the shoulders, if an inch. I tell you, my hair stood right up on end. And you didn't have your gun, Ma said. I thought of that. My, my gun would have been no use even if I had it. You can't fight 50 wolves with one gun. And Patty could, couldn't outrun them. What did you do? asked Ma. Nothing, said Pa. Patty tried to run. I never wanted anything worse than I wanted to get away from there. But I knew if Patty even started, those wolves would be on us in a minute pulling us down. So I held Patty to a walk. Goodness, Charles, Ma said under her breath. Yes, I wouldn't go through such a thing again for any money in the world. Caroline, I never saw such wolves. One big fellow trotted along right by my stirrup. I could have kicked him in the ribs. They didn't pay any attention to me at all. They must have just made a kill and have eaten all they could. I tell you, Caroline, those wolves just closed in around Patty and me and trotted along with us in broad daylight for all the world, like a pack of dogs going along with a horse. They were all around us, trotting along and jumping and playing and snapping with each other, just like dogs do. Goodness, Charles, Ma said again. Laura's heart was thumping fast in her mouth and her eyes were wide open, staring at Pa. Patty was shaking all over, fighting at the bit. Sweat ran off her. She was so scared. I was sweating too, but I held her to a walk and we just went walking all the way among those wolves. They came right along with us a quarter of a mile or so. That big fellow trotted right by my stirrup as if he were there to stay. Then we came to the head of the draw, running down into the creek bottoms, 
and the big, big gray leader went down and all the rest of the pack trotted down behind him. As soon as the last one was in the draw by the creek, I let Patty run. Okay, so here's a picture of all those wolves. Oh my goodness. And look at Pa's face and look at the poor horse. Oh, it must have been so terrifying. Mm -mm -mm. Patty shredded, hit, headed straight for home across the prairie. She couldn't have run faster if, if I had been cutting her with a rawhide whip. I was scared the whole way. I thought the wolves might be coming this way and they might make better time than I was making. I was glad you had the gun, Caroline, and glad the house is built. I knew you could keep the wolves out of the house with the gun, but Pet and the Colts I knew were outside. You need not have worried, Charles. I guess I would manage to save the horses. I was not fully reasonable in my thinking at the time, said Pa. I know you would save the horses, Caroline. Those wolves wouldn't bother you anyway. If they had been hungry, I wouldn't be here to... Little pictures have big ears, Ma said. She meant that he must not frighten the girls, Mary and Laura. All's well that ends well, Paul, Paul replied. And those wolves are miles from here by now. What made them act like that? Laura asked. I don't know, Laura. I guess they had just eaten all they could and they were on their way to the creek to get a drink. Or perhaps they were out playing on the prairie and not paying attention to anything but their play, like you little girls do sometimes. Perhaps they saw that I didn't have my gun and I couldn't do them any harm. Or perhaps they had never seen a man before and didn't even know that men could do them harm. So they didn't think about me at all. Pet and Patty were restlessly walking around and around inside the barn. Jack walked around the campfire. When he stood still to smell the air and listen, the hair lifted on his neck. Bedtime for little girls, Ma said cheerfully. Not even baby Carrie was sleeping yet, but Ma took them all into the house. She told Mary and Laura to go to bed, and she put baby Carrie's little nightgown on and laid her in the big bed. Then she went out outdoors to do the dishes. Laura wanted Pa and Ma to come in the house. They seemed so far away outside. Mary and Laura were good and lay still, but Carrie sat up and played by herself in the dark. In the dark, Pa's arm came from behind a quilt in the doorway and quietly took his gun. Out by the campfire, the tin plates rattled. Then a knife scraped the spider. Pa and Ma were talking together and Laura smelled Pa's tobacco. The house was safe, but it did not feel safe because Pa's gun was not over the door and there was no door. There was only a quilt for a door. After a long time, Pa lifted the quilt. Baby Carrie was asleep then and Ma and Pa came in very quietly and very quietly went to bed. Jack lay across the doorway, but his chin was not on his paws. His head was up listening. Ma breathed softly. Pa breathed heavily, and Mary was asleep too, but Laura strained her eyes in the dark to watch Jack. She could not tell whether Jack's hair was standing up on his neck or not. Suddenly, she was sitting straight up in bed. She had been asleep. The dark was gone, and moonlight streamed through the window hole, and streaks of moonlight came through every crack in the wall. Pa stood black in the moonlight in the window, and he had his gun. Right in Laura's ear, it seemed, a wolf howled. She scringed away from the wall. The wolf was just on the other side of that wall. Laura was too scared to make a sound. The cold was not in her backbone or only, it went all through her. Mary pulled the quilt over her head. Jack growled and showed his teeth at the quilt in the doorway. Be still, Jack, Pa said. Terrible howls curled all around the house and Laura rose out of bed. She wanted to go to Pa but she knew better than to bother him now. He turned his head and saw her standing up in her nightgown. Want to see them, Laura? He asked softly. Laura couldn't say anything, so she nodded, and she padded across the ground quietly. He stood his gun against the wall and lifted her up to the window hole. There in the moonlight sat a half a circle of wolves. They sat on their haunches and looked at Laura in the window, and she looked at them. She had never seen such big wolves. The biggest one was taller than Laura. He was taller than even Mary. He sat in the middle, exactly opposite Laura. 
Everything about him was big, his pointed ears and his pointed mouth with the tongue hanging out and his strong shoulders and his legs and his two paws side by side and his tail curled around the squatting haunch. His coat was shaggy gray and his eyes were glittering green. Laura clutched her toes in a crack of the window wall and she folded her arms on the window slab and she looked and looked at that wolf. But she did not put her head through the empty window space into the outdoors where all those wolves were so near, shifting their paws and licking their chops. Pa stood firm against her back and kept his arm tight around her middle. He's awful big, Laura whispered. Yes, and see how his coat shines, Pa said. The moonlight made glitters in the edge of their shaggy fur all around the big wolf. They are in a ring clear around the house, Pa whispered. Laura padded behind him to the other window. He leaned his gun against that wall and lifted her up again. There, sure enough, was the other half of the circle of wolves. All their eyes glittered green in the shadow of the house. Laura could hear their breathing. When they saw Pa and Laura looking out, the middle of the circle moved back a little way. Pet and Patty were squealing and running inside the barn. Their hooves pounded in the ground and crashed against the walls. After a moment, Pa went back to the other window and Laura went too. They were just in time to see the big wolf lift his nose and point it straight at the sky. His mouth opened and a long howl rose up to the moon. Then all around the house, the circle of wolves pointed their noses toward the sky and answered that howl by howling too. Their howls shuddered through the house and filled the moonlight and quavered across the vast silence of the prairie. And here's a picture. The middle one started the howl and then they all started howling. So they formed a circle. They're all the way around the house and they're howling at the moon. Oh my gosh, that must be so scary. Now go back to bed, little half pint, Pa said. Go to sleep. Jack and I will take care of you all. So Laura went back to bed for a long time though. She did not sleep. She lay and listened to the breathing of the wolves just on the other side of the log wall. She heard the scratch, scratch of their claws on the ground and the snuffling of their noses at the cracks. She heard the big gray leader howl again and then all the other wolves answering him. But Pa was walking quietly from one window hole to the other and Jack did not stop pacing up and down before the quilt that hung in the doorway. The wolves might howl, but they could not get in while Pa and Jack were there. So at last, Laura fell asleep. Wow, that was a really exciting chapter. Oh my goodness. Can you imagine that? Okay, I'm gonna stop here because I read for a long time today, but I couldn't stop with all that exciting, all the exciting wolf happenings. Okay, I'll read to you guys soon.